Hello, and welcome to this conversation about modern art of the Southwest, which is hosted by the Lunder Institute for American Art at Colby College in Maine. My name is Jessica Horton. I'm Associate Professor of Art History at the University of Delaware, and I'm really honored to serve as the Distinguished Scholar for the Lunder Institute uh, Annual Research Fellows Program that will take place in the fall um, and January of 2021 and 2022. And I'm joined tonight uh, by my colleague, the Metropolitan Museum of Art Curator and Lunder Research Fellow, Patricia Maroquin Norby, um, who will have a chance to introduce herself, Patricia, in just a moment. I'm speaking today from Lenape and Nanticoke homelands that connect my home office in Philadelphia to the campus where I teach. And in the fall, Patricia and I hope that we will be able to join um, the five other research fellows and special guests in Maine for um, two, fingers crossed, in-person workshops on the themes that we'll be discussing today. And with that in mind, I've been asked to share my colleagues' land acknowledgement for the Colby Museum and its Lunder Institute. And I quote, um, we're situated in the homeland of the Wabanaki people. We express our respect to the indigenous communities who have lived on these ancestral lands for almost 15,000 years and the future generations. With this acknowledgement, we recognize the legacies of settler colonialism, and we signal an ongoing commitment to building relationships with the Wabanaki, um, unquote. And I will also note that our second research uh, workshop is scheduled to take place in Taos in Northern New Mexico, home of Taos Pueblo. The research fellows gatherings will focus on new scholarly directions in artistic modernisms of the Southwest, building on the Colby Museum collection, which includes, um, as many of you probably know, a, a really uh, strong collection of Taos Society of Artists paintings, as well as Pueblo pottery and other artistic modernisms of the region. The Lunder Talks were established in 2020 uh, to feature artists and scholars in dialogue on new research and creative production within the field of American art. And since Patricia and I haven't yet had a chance to gather in person with the other fellows who I know are gonna bring um, all kinds of ideas and energy and knowledge to shape the conversation, um, we've decided to focus today's conversation on how we've arrived at some of the workshop themes through our own scholarly and curatorial work in indigenous studies. Um, and Patricia, I'd love to turn it to you to say a few words of introduction yourself. Thank you, Jessica. I'd also like to thank everyone at the Lunder Institute for this opportunity. Nadi Hamashak. Hello, everyone. I'm Patricia Marquan Norby. I am Pudapacha, and I would like to acknowledge that as a Pudapacha woman with ancestral roots in the Southwest, I'm a guest here in Lenape Hoki. I'm Associate Curator of Native American Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And prior to joining the Met, I served as senior executive and assistant director of the National Museum of the American Indian in New York. Before that, I was director of the Darcy McNichol Center for American Indian and Indigenous Studies at the Newberry Library in Chicago, Illinois. So my professional background includes museum and archive leadership, working with American Indian and Indigenous collections. I'm also a trained fine artist in painting, drawing, and printmaking and my scholarly work focuses on 20th century American Indian and American art of the Southwest and its connections to environmental conflicts. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Patricia. And just a quick logistical note uh, before we dive in, um, the event is accompanied by closed captioning. So you just need to click the CC icon on your screen. Also, we welcome your participation uh, if you want to ask a question at any time, you can add it to the Q&A feature on your screen. Um, the chat function is reserved for event details, so don't put it there. Um, and we'll turn to your questions in, at the very least, the last 15 minutes of the event tonight. So Patricia, um, it's Earth Day. <laughs> I think we'd probably both agree that every day should be Earth Day, um, but I think uh, I can't really think of a better place to begin the conversation than talking a little bit about your amazing forthcoming book um, titled Water 
Bones and Bombs, Three Artists and the Fight for Northern New Mexico, um, which is going to be published by University of Nebraska Press. And from my perspective, it's an outstanding model of new approaches to 20th century art histories of the Southwest, um, foregrounding your interest in Indigenous and environmental justice. Um, and so I wonder if I could just begin by asking you how those themes connect the three artists in your study um, and how have they shape the way that you're thinking about their artwork. Sure, I'm happy to talk about and give a brief, brief description um, of the book. And, but first I should mention that my book draws uh, directly from my dissertation, which was published online by the University of Minnesota in 2013. And in my work, I examine the paintings of Tony de Pena from San Altifonso and Cochiti Pueblo and um, George O'Keefe and then Helen Hardin from Santa Clara Pueblo. All three artists lived and worked in the Northern Rio Grande and Ch River, Chama River Valleys in Northern New Mexico. And each had very distinct relationships with the land and landscapes of that specific region. In my work, I investigate Tonita Pena's watercolor paintings and their material connections to 20th century water politics in Northern New Mexico and the contradiction of water, the use of water being um, introduced as an art medium by Euro-Americans and then sold to um, art markets. I also expose connections between the painter and printmaker Helen Hardin's studio practices and art and material art material environmental toxin exposure related to nuclear weapons production at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And finally, I argue that Georgia O'Keeffe's Southwest images visually embody intercultural tensions and are far more politically charged than American art histories and O'Keeffe biographies portray. My research approach for the book included American Indian law, New Mexican land grants, legal transcripts, local correspondence and petitions. And I underscore the politics behind modern American art narratives and demonstrate how 20th century American aesthetics and the emphasis on aesthetics, specifically in the Southwest, dismissed indigenous perspectives and contributions to modern American um, art. Yeah, one of the things that is really, I think, exciting about the direction that you take in this book is has to do with the role of artistic materials. And you just sort of hinted it at some of the ways um, with water politics that you're sort of tracing the connection between the materiality of um, artworks and artistic mediums and broader environmental politics. I wonder um, if you could give a couple of more detailed examples. Um, for me, I'm really interested in the sort of new wave of eco-critical and materialist methods um, in and beyond art history and how they can deepen our ways of thinking about artworks beyond their visual, formal, aesthetic qualities. Although, of course, materials also impact all of those elements of an artwork too. Um, but sometimes they can point us to invisible processes as well. Um, and then I know, of course, that, that artistic materials have implications for how you're thinking about landscape. Um, I don't know if you wanna, wanna say anything about that um, kind of loaded term in the history of American art as well. Well, sure. I, I think the way, uh, what I'll do is share two examples directly from the book, because I think that best illustrates how I'm thinking about all of the issues and um, themes that you're touching on. And so I'm going to share two examples. One is on about uh, related to George O'Keefe and the second chapter. And then the second one is about Helen Hardin and the third chapter. So if we could have the slide, second slide. There'll be, there should be one, another slide after this one. Perfect. So between 1936 and 1958, George O'Keefe created 29 different paintings of what is called Chipping or Cerro Pedernal or Pedernal Mountain. And her images depicted this mountain during all seasons from numerous perspectives. And in addition to creating this uh, collection of images of this mountain, O'Keefe also very publicly made verbal and visual claims to this distinct nat natural landmark. Uh, 
And then between 1979 and 84, the National Park and U.S. Forest Services considered honoring George O'Keefe by renaming Chipping O'Keefe Mountain. So this is the um, this is settled feather now or Chipping Zipping. This is a 9,800 foot flat topped mountain, and it's a very prominent landmark in northern New Mexico near Abiquiu. Um, the, the mountain has always been sacred to northern New Mexico's indigenous communities and Sipping's history goes back centuries. Artifacts found on its slopes date back to 7000 BC. So as I mentioned in between 1979 and 84, there was actually um, legal measures taken to rename the mountain O'Keefe Mountain. And re in response to this, Abiquiu citizens protested by circulating a petition and writing letters against this idea. They also published articles that challenged the need of Euro-American non-locals to immortalize O'Keefe by renaming the landmark after an outsider. They also formed an activist group called Los Vecinos de Cerro Pedernal and those vecinos made statements that affirmed their historical and spiritual connection to the mountain and also critiqued O'Keefe and her fans. So um, if we could go to the next slide. The petition read, long, long time ago, a Cerro Pedernal provided the resources for us to survive. It gave us flint so that we could have tools. It also provided us with water and land so that we could farm. The canyon lands that surround its base offered us protection, but more importantly, it gave us a sanctuary, a place of refuge so that we could seek our own God. This really speaks to something that I'm very drawn to, and that is the differences between what I consider um, an aesthetic appreciation of land and landscape and what is often described by art historians as a sense of place um, you hear that, that phrase quite often in regard to O'Keefe as well as other artists. So this aesthetic appreciation versus a long-term intergenerational and um, ecological connection to land and homelands, what I would describe more as kinship ties, but also a sense of responsibility to land, water, and place. And so I'm, I'm very interested in this distinction and this uh, way of engaging and understanding land and landscapes, because I think we're in this moment right now where there is a shift happening. And I think that more and more indigenous um, or non-indigenous people are beginning to understand this um, kinship, the kinship ties that indigenous people have to, to specific homelands and the local environment. So I think I'll go to the second example. And if we could have the next slide. <clears throat> so in chapter three, I talk about the life and art of the painter and printmaker, Helen Hardin. Um, Helen Hardin died at age 41 of breast cancer that metastasized and affected her lungs and liver. And her story um, reflects connections between Pueblo, Pueblo Indian art and the Cold War. Santa Clara Pueblo, Helen Hardin's home community is located less than 20 miles downstream from Los Alamos National Laboratories, which was the creation site of Project Y. And Helen was born in 1943 and she's part of a generation that was unknowingly exposed to radiation pollution due to toxic waste dumping at Los Alamos. So following World War II, heavy metal toxins, um, carcinogenic metals, and also organic solvents were dumped and they seeped into the ground, they flowed down streams, they blew into the air, and they can now all be found in the local water, air, soil, clay, um, grasses, rocks, um, everything in the local environment, including um, local animal populations and their waste. And so these are all natural materials that have always been used for sustenance, for shelter, for energy or heat, um, you know, animal waste or animal, um, um, different types of dung, animal dung are used, as you know, for making pottery. And so these are materials that have always been used um, 
to make Pueblo Indian art. And so this chapter focuses on the dangers that lie in the similar chemi chemical makeup between industrial waste and very specific art materials. And so over time, what happens is that there's what is called um, a double cocktail um, mixture that happens when materials that are absorbed in the body from the environment are then um, enhanced or the effect is enhanced by then being exposed to particular art materials that have that include heavy metals or other types of chemicals that create this uh, reaction within the body. So there's this chemical kinship between the toxic sub substances in the environment and then also the art materials that are being used. Uh, and so it, it, it directly affects American Indian artists in particular because they're often, as you know, the dumping grounds are for toxic materials or radioactive waste or nuclear waste are often directly um, related to where indigenous or BIPOC communities um, are located or, and, and live or call their homelands. And so one thing I wanna point out in these images, I, and these are two of my favorite images of Helen Hardens, is that um, if you can, you might um, be able to see that she has this wonderfully textured or speckled background in her work. And she often worked with acrylic, um, she also worked with acrylic paints. I'm sorry, there's messages coming up in the chat that are distracting me. Um, she worked with acrylic paints to build up these textures and these layers. And then one of the ways that she applied the paint was using an oral atomizer. And so we have to remember that Helen was working with a very early generation of acrylic paints. So they were not the paints that we now know as acrylic paints, which um, are often labeled as non-toxic. Um, but they were a very early generation, not as refined. There were many different types of chemicals present in the early acrylics. And she used an oral atomizer to blow the paint onto her painting surfaces to create this uh, speckled and spotty texture. And in doing so, she was spraying the, the paint. And, and I've suspected that she was also possibly inhaling some of the materials as she was blowing. So her body is within these works. Her breath is within these works. Um, but also it's important to remember that acrylic paints are not really meant to be sprayed. They're meant to be applied with a brush or they're meant to be applied with a sponge or something like that. And they also re can release um, toxic materials as they're drying. So the spray form of acrylic paints is, is the moment when they're the most dangerous to, to artists physically. Who's here? Oh, did you wanna? Yeah, so this is another, that's an amazing image. Yeah, this is um, a really powerful image taken in 1980 by um, the photographer, Bill Boyson. And by this time, Helen realizes what's happening and that um, she's starting to have um, health issues. And she, at this point, she's working in printmaking, specifically etching. And she was kind of playing around in the studio and she puts on this mask and then this photograph is taken of her. But um, what's also powerful about this image is that this is, right around the time that she is diagnosed with cancer. And it also marks a time when uh, um, laws and different regulations, particularly OSHA regulations are now being enforced in professional art studios, including at universities, museums, and other places where art studios and other types of industrial spaces um, are located. And so, OSHA is now enacted and all of these laws are taking place and now being enforced within these spaces. So art studios at universities, for example, start um, completely revamping or for the first time installing ventilation systems. For many people who've been trained in art studios, perhaps at a university or an art school, we're used to now having ventilation systems. That's part of, that's part of, working in a studio. We're also, we also know about the different 
safety practices and um, best practices for handling art materials, wearing gloves or other practices and specific containers for throwing away um, dangerous materials or disposing of um, specific materials. But at the, prior to this, there was really nothing in place. Artists often ate and drank in their studios. They smoked cigarettes and their bodies were absorbing a lot of the, the materials that they were working with. And many artists like Helen worked at home. And so, and in particular, BIPOC communities, um, specifically women, worked at home, had families, and so their families then were also exposed to, to dangerous materials. Yes, as you're um, talking about these embodied dimensions of Hardin's painting, like reminding us of that intimate relationship between body and canvas, right, and paint, um, and this sort of double cocktail of the artistic toxins combined with the environmental poisons, right? Um, I'm reminded of the um, phrase, uh, slow violence that the environmental studies scholar Rob Nixon talks about um, where so many of the environmental catastrophes um, of, the, of the 20th century that are disproportionately um, affecting communities that are already marginalized by poverty, by race, et cetera, um, unfold invisibly, right, and, and out of sight. And this is a really interesting challenge and puzzle for um, people who've been formally trained in art history, which is a sort of discipline dedicated to close looking, right? And you're really um, doing so much work in your book that's about what is invisible to the eye. And then once we come back to Hardin's paintings, with this understanding through material science and environmental studies and all of this, we come back to the paintings and see them so differently, right? Um, so, so that's um, very a sort of very powerful methodology to sort of expand um, what we what we think of as the the concerns of art history in this way. Um, I also want to turn back to your. Um, your work on O'Keefe, because I think it's so interesting that you situate a chapter on this um, canonical, you know, often beloved figure in American art um, in between chapters on two lesser studied indigenous women artists. Um, and I always think of this um, sort of story, a, a former O'Keefe curator, O'Keefe Museum curator shared with me about how the guards would have to sort of watch for, for visitors who would come and try to kiss O'Keefe's paintings, right? This idea that, that this figure is so beloved. Um, but we really come to know a different O'Keefe through your critical assessment of her relationship to land and indigenous communities. Um, and of course the, the um, uh, town of Abiquiu um, is the site of, her former home and a new visitor for the O'Keeffe Museum. And I know you've done a lot of work there. Um, I wonder if you could just maybe reflect a little bit on what sort of, what made you decide to go down this path to sort of put O'Keeffe um, in juxtaposition with Hardin and, and Pena and sort of what that does, I guess, to our, um, um, our understanding of American art uh, and, and how we sort of, you know, come to see this figure differently through your work. So um, I, for, I should first acknowledge that without the Abiquiu community um, and then also the communities, um, Pueblo communities, Northern Pueblo communities, I should specify, this, this book would not exist. So I spent a great deal of time. I spent years establishing relationships with the different communities and making repeat visits to the region. And I still do my best to go out every year and reconnect with a number of people um, that I, or who I worked with. And so it's really important to me to acknowledge their contribution to, to this work. Um, many of them I'm now close friends with and I, I really cherish those relationships. I learned a great deal by the many conversations that I had and so when I first went out to Abiquiu to, um, to connect with people, to talk about O'Keefe, um, I was you know, 
kind of turned away from. And the reason was that the community in Abiquiu was, they were just very tired of talking about O'Keefe. So if you can imagine, it's this really um, small community that um, O'Keefe uh, moved into in, in the late 1930s, um, like, uh, early 1940s, and she sets up residence there, I think around 1945 or 46, I can't remember the exact date, that's when her home in Abiquiu um, is ready for her to move into. And she, at first it was a very awkward entry and she really wasn't used to the, the local customs or ways of interacting with the Abiquiu community at that time. And so she's a very celebrated American artist, but working with the Abiquiu community, I learned a different story that not everyone embraces her or embraced her presence, her long-term presence over 50 years in the Abiquiu Pueblo. And there are people in the community who do embrace her. Um, and then there are others who, who had a very strained relationship with the artist. But one of the things that caught my attention was that everywhere I went in New Mexico, I kept hearing this, um, this name, O'Keeffe country, was identified as O'Keeffe country. But I knew that there were indigenous communities, of course, and I was more interested in their perspectives of O'Keeffe. And so if we could go to the next slide, actually. So this is a postcard and, and a phrase that's widely distributed in Northern New Mexico. And it reads, um, and this is directly relates to Cerro Pedro now or the mountain that I was just talking about. And O'Keefe um, states, it belongs to me. God told me if I painted it often enough, I could, I could have it. And so um, this, this particular phrase is, in um, on postcards, it's in books, it's it's everywhere. I, I think I even saw it recently in a children's book, and so it, I think it really speaks to the sense of um, privilege <laughs> that many outsiders feel about landscapes that they fall in love with, and again, also this aesthetic appreciation of land and landscape rather than kinship or ecological ties to a region. So um, this particular quote really struck me and it's what, it's what started my questions about O'Keeffe's because ultimately, ultimately that's what scholarship is. We're doing detective work, something you know, interests us and then we um, break that down and do a lot of an investigative work. And so that led me to a lot of the um, legal process in regard to um, renaming the mountain, looking at different reports, all of these things that were related to O'Keefe and her presence in, in that region. Yeah, this, this version of the O'Keefe story, um, the way that you're sort of re-narrating it, I think speaks to, you know, a dynamic that we could see in so many other, um, artists of this era who are, are traveling to the Southwest, sometimes as tourists, sometimes as longer term settlers, and sort of layering ideas and infrastructure and, and, and naming, renaming um, uh, on, on land and in, um, in dialogue with indigenous communities, sometimes invited, sometimes not, but then all of this sort of, um, this importation becomes part of what, um, one of our other research fellows, Sasha Scott, has called the strange mixture of art and politics that sort of um, come to define um, the, the region, especially in the early decades of the 20th century. Um, I wonder if I can um, share just a, a couple images um, from, from some of my own work because I've been interested both Patricia in this dynamic that you're describing and also in some ways in the reverse gesture as indigenous art of the Southwest has traveled outward, traveled globally, often through like touring exhibitions. 
Um, sometimes without the artists even knowing that their artwork was sort of mobilized or, or displaced in this manner, um, but which becomes then part of um, a, a, a conversation, I think, about global modernities um, that is really sort of both sort of on the one hand, often exported on behalf of an idea of America or the nation, but also then um, the art sort of has this opportunity, right, to speak to um, globally situated others about indigenous concerns, often connecting um, relationally back to these ideas about place and responsibility that you've been talking about. Can we have the image of the um, US Pavilion of the Venice Biennial in 1932? Um, just by way of example, um, this is sort of some older, um, older research of mine, but part of the story of, I guess, of how I've engaged with, um, with the Southwest in my research, um, found this photograph in the archives of the Venice Biennial, which is um, the oldest and still active global art biennial in the world today modeled on national pavilions um, that were common to 19th century world fairs. Um, and so we see in the United States Pavilion, which is one of, it's a neoclassical um, style building that sort of sits alongside other national pavilions in the fishtail of Venice. And we're looking um, at a doorway. I wanna um, direct your attention on the left to a painting by a Taos Society of Artists founding member, Ernest Blumenschein, um, which features a procession of penitentes, a, a Roman Catholic sect um, in Northern New Mexico. And on the right, another Taos Society member, Walter Ufer's painting featuring um, an indigenous man uh, and um, woman on horseback um, the art historian John Ott has identified this man as Jim uh, Mirabal of Taos Pueblo, who often modeled for Ufer. And so we see these, you know, paintings that are rich in detail, um, where sort of landscape, ideas about landscape are meeting um, sort of ethnographic curiosity about um, the diverse cultural uh, situation in Northern New Mexico. But then through the doorway, um, you can glimpse a cluster of paintings by early Pueblo uh, painters. Um, Tonita Pena was included in this exhibition, as you know, um, Patricia. And I have also um, identified this painting of mountain sheep kachinas that has been, um, that was created by the artist Fred Cabote. Um, Cabote was born at Hopi Second Mesa in Northern Arizona, but learned to paint while he himself was displaced um, forcibly uh, at Federal Indian Boarding School in Santa Fe in the 1910s. And along with Pena um, sort of stands at the, the beginning of a, of a painting movement that um, often uh, featured images of um, the public portion of Pueblo ceremonies. Um, and in, in, in this case, um, Kachinas for Hopi are um, embodiments of um, the powerful spiritual beings that, that um, embody natural forces in the environment. Um, and so these were painted from memory by Kabodi while he was away at boarding school and then undergo this kind of double displacement as they come to represent um, the United States in this national pavilion. And if you can turn to the next slide, we see that there was actually uh, an entire uh, room of, um, of native art, uh, the name, uh, textiles, uh, Pueblo pottery, and um, pa paintings by the artists I've mentioned. Um, this was curated by John Sloan, a, a well-known artist and patron of the Pueblo painting movement. Um, but I think what's interesting here for me is how this kind of framework of nationalism starts to fall apart. The more time we spend, um, uh, looking at contextualizing and trying to understand what is happening for indigenous artists who are painting during this period amid the um, struggles against federal assimilation policy and to maintain the integrity of cultural practices and lifeways, land, waterways, and sovereignty against the uh, encroachments of a settler state. 
you know, this doesn't align uh, quite neatly with the nationalist impulse of the pavilion. Um, and so we start to have a much more kind of contested um, sense of what, uh, what, you know, the so-called American Southwest actually is in this moment. Um, and then just very briefly, I want to show um, one more image from uh, my current uh, book project um, called Earth Diplomacy, Indigenous American Art and Reciprocity uh, from 1953 to 73. I'm showing you an image of a later exhibition that circulated um, through seven countries. Uh, um, and I'm showing you the showing here at University of Tehran in 1965, which was um, part of a US information agency sponsored Cold War tour. Uh, I know Patricia, we're both sort of interested in this sort of later moment, this Cold War moment um, uh, in, in the Southwest. And I wanna just point out the next stop after the university showing here was the National Iranian Oil Company headquarters. Um, so part of US cultural diplomacy initiatives that were at the same time connecting the um, extractive industries and presence of the military industrial complex in Northern New Mexico, as Patricia was discussing, to the role of the United States in international relations, and especially this sort of expanding resource frontier of carbon intensive industries. Um, and we actually you know, know this was happening a little more than a decade after the CIA um, headed coup um, to remove a democratically elected um, prime minister in Iran, all surrounding, of course, oil politics. Um, so for me, this is sort of a moment where, you know, Pueblo painting is bound up in the global scope of environmental crises um, led by the United States and really connecting settler colonialism of the Southwest to these kind of forms of imperialism internationally. Um, and of course, we could say a lot about how um, the artists who were unwitting participants in this exhibition are nonetheless doing a kind of counter work in um, the way in which they are painting um, uh, indigenous uh, ceremonial um, and everyday life ways that are um, you know, subject to continual resistance to the encroachment of the settler state. Um, so that was a lot, but let me just pause and um, turn to you, Patricia. Um, I, I, I welcome any you know, response to what I shared, but it also makes me wonder what you hear when you hear the phrase that's so sort of popular in American art history that we're talking about the American Southwest, right? Um, and uh, you've already talked about the sort of um, issue of renaming and claiming that is happening in O'Keeffe country, so-called O'Keeffe country. Um, I'm also wondering about the way that borders have been imposed on the Southwest. Um, I'm thinking of the US-Mexico border and so on um, and how that sits or doesn't sit with indigenous understandings of home and place, but also indigenous fluidity and movement um, across what we now, um, you know, now understand to be an international border. Well, first I'd like to go back to, um, we don't have to go back to the slide, but I do want to go back to the international context that you've um, introduced, because I think, I know that there is a, a, a long, um, there's a long tradition of associating the Pueblo watercolor painters with this national identity, and then that brings it into this international context. So even in as early as 1925, there are critiques by um, art critics. So for instance, the Chicago Tribune's Eleanor Jewett, she compares Pueblo watercolor paintings to Persian miniatures. And so there's just these ongoing conversations um, about that place the style of Pueblo watercolors in context um, internationally. And so it's not surprising to me that these works would travel as far as they have while Pueblo artists were completely unaware that this was happening and also 
the artists themselves often stayed at home and never left their communities. Some of them did. Um, there are a few that traveled internationally as well, but the majority of them, from what I understand, did not travel as extensively as their work did. So um, it's interesting to me too that the Pueblo watercolors in particular take on this national identity because it wasn't, in, you know, the the um, height of the watercolors is typically the early 20th century up to um, the 1940s. And it wasn't until 19, was it 1948 that Pueblo people actually had um, voting rights. So I find that interesting as well. I hope, I think that's the right date. Um, but I believe um, native communities in uh, New Mexico and Arizona, it was quite a while before they could even vote. So there's just this contradiction there that's happening all the time. Also this entry into private um, spaces of indigenous communities, you, you showed one of the images um, of the Penitentes brothers. Um, you know, this type of, this type of inf um, intrusion or imposition still goes on. Recently, the O'Keeffe Museum um, and I think the O'Keeffe Museum is really um, doing a lot of work to rethink their approach to local communities. But I think it was just as uh, recently as last year, the O'Keeffe Museum posted on social media a photograph of a penitente uh, morada in Abiquiu and were publicly called out for invading private spaces. And so this mm -hmm. happens all the time. It still goes on and it happened even, you know, as early. Um, I think it was like 19, um, 19, what, 20s or even before that, that um, different rules were put in place by different communities to prevent people, artists in particular, photographers, other, other um, scholars from engaging in um, with imagery of within the Pueblos, within their private spaces. I'm even thinking of O'Keefe when she first came to Abiquiu um, or Northern New Mexico in 1929, she was known to repeatedly go back to Taos Pueblo again and again and again um, and pay money to get a specific image of one of the architectural buildings on the northern part of the Pueblo. And her friend um, writes in a letter, um, Rebecca Strand writes to her husband and said, oh, she's paying so much money to go back so many times to rework this image. and. What's interesting about that is that O'Keefe could not recognize the cultural boundaries. There's a reason that a fee was charged for people to go into those spaces and it was often to deter people from creating those images. But it, instead O'Keefe just keeps, keeps paying more money to go back and rework her painting, which also speaks to her sense of privilege, but also not being able to recognize those cultural boundaries that were in place. Um, so coming back around <laughs> to your question uh, and about cultural fluidity and boundaries, one of the things that we're now practicing at the Met, if I could have the next slide, please. Well, I'll just talk about it <laughs> and get the image is that originally in the Art of Native America exhibition, we had a map that defined the geographical boundaries of um, American Indian communities in the US. And this was, this was a gesture that was meant to help ground um, people as they came into the space and understand uh, the homelands, the particular homelands of, um, actually, if we could go back um, a slide. There you go. And so one of the first things I did in regard to the exhibition was I had the map removed and replaced by a um, land and water statement. And I call it a statement because I really feel like the word acknowledgement is not strong enough. And so a statement, an active statement really says more about how um, we intend to practice moving forward from this moment. And so um, this land and water statement um, has very specific um, 
specific points in it, not only about how we plan to continue to work with indigenous communities and to foreground indigenous voices, but also understanding the uh, intergenerational and ecological ties of the um, art items and, and ancestral items in, in the gallery space and on view, and that they directly, directly tie to language, to song, to dance, to all of these things that make indigenous communities who they are. And so, um, and we honor the, that preciousness of, of those items. And so in addition to having this land and water statement, we also acknowledge in it that the, the Met will own our own um, historical responsibility and the impact that we have had as an institution upon the local land and waters and indigenous peoples of the New York region. So it's owning our own historical legacy while also making clear the way that we plan to um, work with native and indigenous communities moving forward. We paired the land and water statement with a ceramic whale tooth created by the Shinnecock artist, Courtney Leonard. And this, this particular sculpture speaks to the sacredness of whales and also environmental issues that um, directly affect the Shinnecock community. Thanks, Patricia, for showing this. Um, we, uh, believe it or not, are already at time to open this up to our audience, but I do just want to briefly make the connection between this work that you're doing at the Met and the reinterpretation of the American wing with Indigenous um, art and environmental concerns at the center. Um, and some of the work that the fellows are um, invited to do in reinterpreting Colby Museum collections so um, Patricia and all of the fellows were asked to select um, one or several artworks to research and do a sort of short write-up at the end of the fellowship period. And maybe we could just, if we could go back to the slides just to show the two that, that Patricia chose. And if anyone from the audience wants to ask about that, that's great. But I do wanna just mention it will, that, that scholarly work and that reinterpretation will in fact inform an exhibition at the museum that will put native and non-native artists of the Southwest in dialogue. Um, and so I think there's um, a, a really um, strong interplay between the work that you're doing at the Met and, and what the Colby Museum is um, hoping to, or, you know, taking from um, the, the conversations we're planning next year. Um, so these are the two, the two works that I know you're, um, you're at work on. I'm sorry we don't uh, uh, well, have- I'll just, I'll just say um, yeah. the, the two items that I picked were this um, black on black platter, um, platter by Ramona Sanchez Gonzalez, who is from San Aldefonso Pueblo. Um, she was a contemporary of Maria Martinez and Ramona and Maria worked both in black on black, but Ramona was also an expert in polychrome um, methods as well. So she also used red on red and she was highly respected at San Altefanso for her work. Her work is very rare, but she's not as widely recognized as Maria Martinez. And part of this is because of particular Pueblo politics, but also um, I'm interested in, in the narrative of how specific artists are recognized by, by the wider public while others are not, even when it's very obvious that the work is you know, of a particular quality. Um, the reason that I chose these two pieces, the, the image on the right is um, Marston Hartley's New Mexico Landscape from 1918. And um, our colleague, Sasha Scott, you know, she writes about Marston Hartley. Also my um, colleague, Randall Griffey at, at the Met is also an expert on Hartley and you know, they talk about his um, particular appreciation of New Mexican landscape. He painted in New Mexico between 1918 and 1920. But I love this work because it depicts Ocupin um, or Turtle Mountain. Um, Ocupin is um, Turtle Mountain in Tewa. And so that, when I saw this image, I knew right away um, what this was depicting. And it also signaled me to me the difference between Hartley's engagement with the landscape and then also Tewa engagement and connections and kinship 
with the local landscape. And so this is something that I've been um, very interested in for a while and I'm you know, still working this out. Obviously the Lunder Institute hasn't happened yet. And so we're at the ver very early stages of, of developing our scholarship, but I'm very excited about where the Institute um, and also where this fellowship program and our engagement with the work is going to go. I'm looking forward to hearing the work of my colleagues. Patricia, we have another um, great question. Actually, the first question was about your, your choice of artists. So, so um, we're, we're into the Q&A now. And you have a question in the chat. Um, could you talk more about why New Mexico provides a useful intersection for studying art, eco-criticism, and the politics of land? Is there something unique about New Mexico um, and its history of land and water rights? Or have you found other regions where your approach could be applied as well? Well, I think that there are, are many cases and many regions where this approach um, can be applied. Um, you know, I think of Cherokee baskets, for instance, and how over time baskets made in the Southeast, the materials that are used to make them, um, going from one specific material that was once prevalent in the local environment, and then having to switch to another material, um, willow, for instance, going from specific grasses to willow because, because of environmental shifts or environmental de um, degradation, particular materials are no longer available to indigenous communities. And there's, there's um, research, extensive and very good research on these shifts in materials. I think a lot of this comes out of my own practice as an artist, my fascination with working materials, um, also my own um, concerns, health concerns as a practicing artist, as you know, a trained fine artist. Those are things that you think about when you're working with the materials. And so this really came out of my own experience um, in the studio but I think there's a number of regions where this can, um, where this type of scholarship can be applied to. I think, of course, um, environmental politics and um, indigenous art making methods and creative production, all of it ties together because so much of what is made speaks to the home place, speaks to the local region, all of these things. And that's not to say that indigenous people aren't engaging with other materials as well, of course we do. But um, as you know, much of what, what indigenous artists and Native American artists create speaks to homeland and identity. And, and I think that that's you know, part of the strength of it, part of the beauty and what I love about it. I do wonder too, just thinking about the question, um, you know, I think there are specific reasons why the Southwest um, often through a kind of distorted lens about what um, the ecologies and communities of the Southwest are, but that it's been sort of targeted for extractive industries, right? I think there's a, of course, we can, we can trace specific historical reasons why Los Alamos becomes the site for a, you know, pretty covert um, project, right? It sort of um, has to do with the way that Euro-Americans have imagined um, um, places like the Southwest um, sort of fantasies about deserts and emptiness and um, um, such spaces as being sort of host to um, experiments in nation building, right? Absolutely. So I think there's reasons um, from that perspective why the Southwest is particularly um, been a, particularly an intense site of conflict around resource extraction. Right. Um, and also in the early 20th century, um, you have to remember that there was a huge Euro-American um, encroachment population increase into the Southwest. And so this really put um, a, a lot of strain on local natural resources. And also there was a lot, there were a lot of legal conflicts over land, um, particular, you know, indigenous land. And so, uh, and many of those cases are widely known. The Burson Bill, for instance, is one that's consistently associated with the native art production again and again and again. Um, but also as uh, indigenous communities, their homelands begin shrinking and there's more um, Euro-American encroachment into the region, 
and resources become more strained, indigenous people are pushed into art markets, right? And, and capitalist systems, which was something that uh, was newly introduced on, and became more prevalent, particularly in the late 19th and early 20th century. So in that sense, the Southwest and specifically Northern New Mexico is this microcosm for all of the issues that we're talking about. Um, but also what, you know, at what price? So, you know, once once communities start making art at, at a, you know, mass producing art that has never been mass produced before, then it introduces a whole nother layer of issues. Like for instance, pottery being mass produced then introduces um, issues or health issues that are related to black lung because of the constant exposure uh, to the different types of silica that are in in ceramics and pottery making, and so at the, on the one hand, as um, Pueblo art patrons and non um, non Indian patrons are uh, applauded for encouraging uh, Native people to engage with art markets as their homelands are being um, reduced. Um, they also are, I think, responsible for um, a number of these other issues that then come in come into play. Mm -hmm. Patricia, we have um, a question about why it was important for you to remove the map at the introduction to the exhibition as you gestured to. I'd love to hear you talk more about that too, and whether um, how it might relate to your thinking about Georgia O'Keeffe and her lands both being a kind of colonial technology of surveying and possession. And then um, do you see modern Southwest landscapes of the 20s and 30s as participating in this colonial practice of possession? How do you distinguish between aesthetic appreciation as you termed it and the history of landscape as a possessive form implied in the work of artists like O'Keeffe and Hartley? These are all great questions. I think I can only answer one though. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it was, it was a multi-part one. I welcome um, people if they want to reach out and, and I'm happy to answer those questions uh, more thoughtfully and carefully. Um, but in regard to the map, uh, I really felt like the map itself was really more tied to a settler colonial <laughs> perspective of dividing indigenous communities geographically and, and attempting to create these very distinct boundaries um, when in reality, there was much more cultural fluidity and um, exchange. Uh, so there was a lot going on in intermarriage, um, interconnections between different communities, um, conflict, all of these things. Uh, and so to have maps um, is, I, I felt like it was very, um, a, an awkward, awkward thing to have because it is a settler colonial, um, practice, not to say that indigenous people didn't have maps. Uh, we have wonderful, a wonderful indigenous map at the Newberry Library where I worked um, before, but the maps, um, indigenous maps often are about the interconnectedness of spaces. So there might be a map with circle, circles on it that um, are, show locations of communities and those circles are interconnected by lines and um, references to water. And so there's those maps are more about interconnection where I felt like the map, there are other maps that really attempt to divide indigenous people. And so in regard to um, Native American sovereignty and indigenous sovereignty, I feel very strongly that we need to rethink maps we also re, re need, to, um, need to rethink um, borders, national borders, and specifically the um, US-Mexican border, um, because there was much more fluidity and movement and what was happen, um, happening before these boundaries were imposed. So that was the main reason for um, removing the map. And I've been asked this question several times and I, sometimes answer uh, briefly, well, we don't have a map in the gallery when we look at a Jackson Pollock. So why do we have to have a map when we look at uh, American Indian art? Um, you know, a lot of people don't know where Cody, Wyoming is. You know, other people do, but we don't have these maps in the um, non-Indian gallery. So I'm, you know, I'm a little hesitant at this point 
to have them in, in the native galleries. Now we've had these conversations too in our university museum setting when I teach curatorial seminars where uh, graduate students are acting as as collectives to bring exhibitions of, of native art into being in a university museum setting. And, you know, on the surface, the map is this sort of educational tool. Um, but I find it, it, it seems to somehow imply an expectation that, that visitors sort of don't need, it sort of implicitly suggests it's okay not to know um, about the indigenous names and places um, in which we are either guests or invited or not, right? Um, and so I, I just wonder about the sort of expectation it sets um, of sort of letting audiences off the hook for knowledge that we all need to have a responsibility to develop, right? Absolutely. Um, um, I think that non-Indigenous um, communities also should, should be doing their homework. Um, we live in, you know, with amazing technology. It's, it's not too hard to look up where community is from. And I've also been asked about, in regard to my work at the Met, about having um, the Native American Indigenous art in other galleries throughout um, the museum, which I'm all in support, in support of. But I also think it's important to have a designated space that consistently and continually highlights um, Indigenous perspectives and Indigenous um, art and, and also, you know, I want to mention that the art itself speaks to place, it speaks to location, it speaks to ties to homelands and also, you know, the, the uh, local environment. And I'm more of the mindset, then we can invite uh, non-Indian artists like Pollock or O'Keefe or whomever we choose to be guests in our space and, and perhaps exhibit um, Native and non-Native art um, in conversation. I, I prefer that, that approach. Patricia, I think it's time for us to thank our audience for your attention um, this past hour. I had um, such a good time as always talking with you, Patricia, about your amazing work. Um, and I'm really looking forward personally to um, carrying this forward in a group setting um, next year. Thank you for having me. It went by so fast. Yeah, an hour is really short when you're doing the talking. Um, thank you, everyone. Be well and take good care. Thank you. Good night.